I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're in our quarter, Making Friends for God, and this week we're looking at lesson number nine, Developing a Winning Attitude. Oh, sounds fantastic. That's right, we need the right perspective and outlook if we're gonna go win souls for Christ, right? We sure do. All right, so let's talk about that. And that starts with prayer. <laughs> it does start with, why don't you start with a prayer and we'll dive in. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the privilege of knowing you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Lord, for knowing your truth and for being in a position that we're able to share that truth with others. Now bless us by your Holy Spirit as we go through these talking points this week, uh, that we may be a blessing to those uh, who are studying these lessons across the world field. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So again, we're talking everything in the context about making friends for God, how to effectively share our faith. And one of the key things we need to talk about is what the whole lesson is about this week, this attitude. What is the, what is the mindset that we should have as we look towards the work of well, souls? Well, our, our memory verse talks about being ready to give an answer. Uh, you know, you're thinking of in terms of sharing your faith. And then it ends by saying, with meekness and fear. Mm -hmm. And so this is what this week's lesson is really touching on is, is making sure that we have the right attitude when we share with others because your attitude can affect uh, the outcome. The lesson on su uh, Sabbath afternoon, uh, the second paragraph there says, Jesus never exhibited a tinge of pride or superiority. He saw in every human being one created in the image of God yet fallen by sin and one whom he came to save. No one was beyond his love. None had fallen so low that his grace could not reach them. He showed respect to all he came in contact with, and he treated them with the dignity they deserved. He influenced people for his kingdom because he believed in people. Mm. So all of that is, is just telling us of the attitude Jesus had in witnessing. Okay, and so as we review this week's, as we do each week, we have these accompanying study guides or, or outline notes here, whatever you want to call them, that are available right there on the bottom of the website at michigansspm.org slash resources. And we'll have these available. You can click on that. But each week we try to take the seven days worth of, you know, study and boil it down to a, just a few main talking points. And so why don't we walk through an overview of what those points are before we go back and dive into each one in detail. Shall we well, do that? Well, absolutely. Okay. Um, the first talking point this week is that everyone is a witness. That's point number one. Okay. And of course, we will develop that, uh, explain that as we go on. Mm -hmm. Key point number two is that attitude determines outcome. Okay. And uh, your attitude makes all the difference in, in your witnessing endeavors. And then finally, uh, key point number three is don't forget to tell the truth. <laughs> and again, you'll see what that... It almost seems a little silly, but that has to be a point, but it is, yeah. You know, it does almost seem silly, but I'm, it may not seem as silly when we get done with this. Exactly, outline. exactly. But let's go back to that power positive attitude for yes. a second. What is the, what is the approach attitude-wise that we should have as we go out and look to do the work of witnessing for Jesus? Well, it's interesting. Friday, on Friday's lesson, it makes this point. There's a quote from gospel workers and on, on discussion question three, and I'm just gonna read a piece of that quote, the first part, it says, the very act of looking for evil in others develops evil in those who look. Mm. By dwelling upon the faults of others, we are changed into the same image. So this is interesting, mm. it's saying that, that if I'm being critical of the people that I'm trying mm -hmm. to, to witness to, uh, for anybody for that matter, people in the church, whatever, it's going to actually develop the traits that if, if I'm, you know, if I'm focusing on your bad qualities, mm -hmm. it's that principle in scripture mm. that says, by beholding, we become changed. I'm going to reflect those bad qualities. Now that made me think of another quote that I think is even more to this point, And mm -hmm. it's in the book of edu uh, education. It's in the outline. In fact, you might want to share that there on uh, our introduction of the lesson. It's Page 289 from the Book of Education. Now, this is in the context speaking, again, at the Book of Education, children and young people, but it's a principle that applies to all as the statement continues. But it says, children and youth are benefited by being trusted. Many, even of the little children, have a high sense of honor. All desire to be treated with confidence and respect, and this is their right. They should not be led to feel that they cannot go, or go out or come in without being watched. Now, listen to this. Suspicion demoralizes, 
producing the very evils it seeks to prevent. Phenomenal. That's a, that's a very heavy concept there, but suspicion itself, the attitude of suspicion actually harms the other person by affecting their attitude and it produces the very evil it seeks to prevent. Well, you've seen it if you've not experienced it. You know, if somebody's always saying, well, you're, you're, you're gonna end up messing up anyway and you're gonna do something wrong, you're like, why try? Yeah. And I've seen that, not just in children, but in adults. And so, th again, this speaks to the attitude that we convey when we're working with another soul. If mm -hmm. we're always acting like you're never gonna mount anything, it mm -hmm. just might be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, and so we don't want to, exactly that self-fulfilling prophecy, like harm our efforts before we even begin by having the wrong mindset going into it. That's right. So it, it, and a lot of that talks to attitude, but even kind of backing up from that, our key point number one is that everyone is a witness. <laughs> yes. Um, not everyone witnesses. And why don't you expand yeah, on that a little Yeah, because, well, it, even the term witness has come to be kind of compartmentalized. I'm gonna go right. do some witnessing or I'm gonna go witness as opposed to like, it's, I'm gonna take some time off from witnessing. Like you can turn it on and off like a switch or I'm in the I'm in my office hours of witnessing where I'm, versus my off time. It, it's like the word evangelism and it always cracks me up yeah. here. Our church is doing evangelism now. Like doing evangelism, <laughs> yeah. you know, evangelism is, is something that it should be happening all the time. Exactly. But it's the same way, witnessing is yeah, like on the personal a thing level. we do exactly. sometimes when the, you know, when the sun's just right in the eastern yeah. sky, whatever. No, well, I mean, I've had the BibleStudyOffer.com sticker on the back of my car, and how I drive is a witness for that thing <laughs> I've attached. So if we claim the name Christian, or Seventh-day Adventist in particular, That's right. um, people are already going to be thinking something, or they're going to be loaded and preparing to see something in you, and whether you intend it or not, you're going to be showing something to them. You're going to be That's witnessing. Right. So witnessing is not an option. That's witnessing right. you're is gonna be, an automatic. You're always a witness. You're either a good one or a bad one. That's right, but the but witness is going to happen. <laughs> and so that needs to be remembered in, in coming into the, the, so the attitude that you have can't be turned on and off. It's like, well, I'm going to go witnessing, so I'm going to be nice. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> and then I'm going to go back to being crabby. Well, or even the same thing, because we're like, well, the bottom of Sunday's lesson, you have it in the notes here, but yes. the very, very bottom of the page, it says, we never know for sure the impact of our words and actions on others, either for good or for bad. Hence, why must we always be careful about what we say and do in the presence of others? And it's automatically because we're being watched. Well, we are... <laughs> I, I was telling you before the story of a guy that when I first came into the church, I, th this guy gave his testimony. I don't know what he, I forget what his job was. It wasn't in ministry. It was just a secular job. And people would come in and out of the business. And one day one of the customers comes up to him and he says, hey, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? And it dawned on him, you know, they never <laughs> had a Bible study together. He didn't come to the guy's church. He's like, he knows I'm an Adventist. And then he's thinking, He's known all along that I've been having it. Who else knows? What? Is it possible? Yeah. To, yeah. Well, and then what has he seen? Yes, right. Right? Because you're thinking, well, you know, is that turn on and off? Like, I wasn't in a Bible study where I just turned on my, right. my Christianity. So he knows I'm a Christian all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's a very intimidating and should be overwhelming thought to us. Not that we can't handle it, but I mean, we need to be cognizant of the responsibility that we take when we call right. pick up the name Christian and carry it with us. That's right. And Jesus was always cognizant. Jesus didn't have, witnessing wasn't a turn on and off for him. That's right. It was, it was who he was. And so that when we talk, key point number one is everyone is a witness. Key point number two is that attitude determines outcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, we find this ideally modeled in the life and ministry of Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, we, I drew this from Monday and uh, Wednesday's lesson, uh, lessons both. Monday talks about an attitude adjustment, is talking a lot about attitude, and then um, Wednesday, well, in fact, even a little bit from Sunday, because Sunday goes into the woman at the well, the woman mm -hmm. of Samaria, mm -hmm. and that's an example of, you know, the, we, the Bible tells us right off in John 4 that there was a rift between uh, Samaritans and Jews that went way back. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the woman at the well was even surprised that Jesus approached her in a friendly way because that just was out of character mm. with what the Jews had the Jews, if the Jews would even approach the Samaritans. Right. And so that whole experience, that his attitude arrested her attention and ultimately um, uh, uh, gained her audience. In other words, she 
was willing to listen because m largely in part in right. due to his attitude. And the contrast there, of course, is the disciples had no interest in stopping by. They didn't understand, but in Christ says, no, I need to do this. Right. Like he had a different, he was looking for something. He had a different expectation, a different attitude. And, um, you know, that, there's that statement in volume nine of the testimonies. It's included in the notes here. Yeah, um, and it's also at the bottom of Tuesday's lesson. That's true. In the lesson. If we would humble ourselves before God, and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. And mm. I don't know about the weight of that hitting you, but it really hits me because, you know, doing the work of an evangelist and preaching campaigns and doing seminars and lectures and trying to get Bible studies, we're always trying to know our, our answers for our faith better, uh, be able to articulate the truth clear more clearly. And here, Everything listed, kindness, courteousness, tenderheartedness, these are all attitude things mm. that would give a hundredfold uh, more effectiveness yeah, to the work. Incredible. It's incredible that attitude is that important. Well, when you think about, you know, the reality is, you think about this statement. When we're sharing our faith, people get defensive. We get defensive. The people we're witnessing to get defensive, right? Because it's you, you're, you're being challenged with what you... No, and it's it can be unsettling to somebody that mm. you're saying what I've always learned is wrong, mm -hmm. and 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 th that's how a person can feel. And let me just clarify, that's not because you're saying that. I hear that all the time. Adventists that I know, as long as I've been in the church, don't go up and say, "Hey, by the way, everything you believe is wrong, and you're just an idiot." Yeah. Okay, we talk that way sometimes. Like that's what witnessing is. Uh, it's not what witnessing is. And most people don't do that, mm -hmm. but you still feel that way. Mm. The, you can say it as kind as you want, but that's how it, it mm -hmm. hits a person when yeah. they hear the truth. And so that's what I hear her saying in this statement is, we need to understand that it's a challenge to, be, to learn the truth for the first time, and we need to put ourselves in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And so the, the kind-hearted, the tender-hearted, uh, the, the courteousness, the being pitiful, is trying to put ourselves where they are and understand that even if they are a person I'm witnessing to is abrasive, it may not be because they're an abrasive person, but because they just don't know how to deal with the yeah. truth. Yeah, they're wrestling with conviction and clarity right. and it's it's a lot to take in. So again, the attitude needs to reflect the attitude of Jesus. Of course. Um, and that's rooted in God's love for sinners. The the lesson on Wednesday talks about the foundation of acceptance, and it directs us to Romans 15, 7 and Ephesians 4, 32. And of course, Ephesians 4, 32, I love that. It talks about how we ought to forgive others as mm -hmm. God in Christ uh, uh, forgave us. We need to be considering, uh, well, the lesson puts it uh, on uh, Wednesday in the first paragraph. It makes this point. It says, because Christ has forgiven and accepted each one of us, how can we possibly refuse to forgive and accept one another? And obviously, if we really could embrace the way God has treated us, it would it, it, it couldn't it couldn't help but affect the way our attitude is toward others. Mm. And that's the reason it's brought up in the lesson that uh, <laughs> God's when we understand, you know, first John 4:19, we love God before because he first loved us. When that when we accept that and we realize that, that leads us to be much more uh, compassionate toward others. You know, I'm laughing because um, we're talking about, in theory, how would we approach someone who doesn't know truth and want to make sure we're kind and sensitive yes. and everything about it, because uh, they're going to be hearing some new things that might be counter to what they already know. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to kind of do the same thing with this term acceptance, right? Because yes. inside the church, we hear a lot about acceptance. We need to accept people. And look at that sentence you just read again. Because Christ has forgiven and accepted each one of us, how can we possibly refuse to forgive and accept one another? I can almost guarantee, now I'm not a prophet nor the son of a no, prophet, but right. I can almost guarantee that in this week's Sabbath school classes right. across the Michigan Conference and where else the, wherever else this goes, Come there's going to the be a lot of conversation about acceptance. What yes. does it mean to accept people? We should be more to be more accepting. And, um, and, and there's the trouble with language is it has certain limitations and it can be kind of uh, uh, buttressing other ideas that we don't want it connected to. And the word acceptance... Um, is kind of a loaded term at this point, right? Um, because yeah. we don't want to say we accept people and endorse the misconceptions they hold or the 
out of harmony lifestyle practices they might you know engage in but we want to be accepting what does it mean to be accepting of yes. people in this day and age well i'm thinking about that and i'm, I'm afraid that for many um, church members my desire to be accepting is more for me than it is for the other person mm, flesh uh, that out a little bit rather than accepting you know and this is where the misunderstanding of accept acceptance comes from because um First of all, the Bible doesn't use the word acceptance mm. the way we use it. And, and, and a, a bigger challenge is that I don't know how it's been used over the years, but in the last at least couple decades, acceptance in our language now means this is what you get, take it or leave it. I'm not changing. Mm -hmm. And God does not accept anybody in those terms. Like, I'm not changing God. This is what it's going to be. You come to God to change. And so... Uh, mm. Elder Richard O'Phil used to say it this way, that, that Jesus, using the language of Scripture, Jesus receives sinners just as they are. He doesn't accept them just as they are because he, mm. wants to, he wants them to change. He wants to transform them. So he receives sinners. And again, if, if the idea of acceptance is to say that God loves everyone, that's fine. Absolutely. Yep. But, but we, what we do is we, we talk about acceptance, and like you said, and I've heard those discussions, and I mean, they get pretty, pretty intense. intense. Yeah. Like, we need to be more accepting. And what that often really is, is I don't want people to not like me. Mm. And, and we so certainly don't want my to My idea have, of acceptance yeah. isn't because I'm worried about them being hurt. It's because I'm worried about being unpopular. Well, yeah, but even if that weren't the case, there's this there's this notion out there that people will be hurt by the articulation of truth, and therefore right. we need to protect them from that pain and the hurt feelings that would come with it, and so we need to just accept them as they are more. And all of those mm -hmm. phrases I've heard so many times, but even, I mean, drilling down into more specifics here, when we talk about the local church, oftentimes acceptance is code for membership, right? We, we yes. even talk about it, accepting them into membership. And so that's a big thing to talk about. I mean, we're talking about right. baptismal standards and church leadership and whatnot. And so I think we need to flesh out a little bit of the distinction between what it means to, to receive people as they are and versus yes. accept them into membership or hold them up into leadership. I mean, these are different things, right? Right. And even again, just to stick with the language of the lesson, I'm fine to say accept them as they are if, if we know what we're talking about the same thing. For example, the lesson says on Wednesday, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, four is one sentence, paragraph. Um, fifth paragraph says this, the second, second sentence in, genuine acceptance means that we accept people as they are with all their sinful habits because they are human beings created in the image of God. Now, I understand what the intent was of mm -hmm. that statement. Yes. But I'm going to tell you that most people will read that and it wouldn't surprise me if this isn't parroted in I don't know how many Sabbath school classes right. as saying, yeah, we need to just accept them as as they are, mm -hmm. almost as if like you're saying, they ought to just be, you know, leave it up to God and we ought to make them members and all that, yeah. which we don't do as a Seventh-day Adventist. Our policy doesn't allow for that because scripture doesn't allow for that. In other words, Elder Finley in another place uh, it's not in this particular lesson or in this quarterly as I've seen it, but he says that we have no standards for fellowship. Fellowship means you come into the church just as you are. That's right. But if you want to become a member, there are biblical standards for membership. No standards for fellowship. Come in and fellowship with us, okay? But if you want to become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there are biblical standards, right? Yes. We didn't make them up. The Bible made them up. And if you move into leadership, there are even higher standards for leadership. There are certain things that a member may do, but as a leader, because you're anyway. Right. And we won't get into all that. But again, the idea of acceptance being, if you want to say in that context, yeah, we accept people into fellowship. Sure. But again, we, we roll into the idea of acceptance that... that um, Basically, come in as you are and stay as you are, and we won't ever say a, a thing about your lifestyle mm -hmm. or, you know, your live-in arrangements yeah. and all these other things. It's not true. You're going to hear some, and, the, and then what happens is with that mindset, if the pastor gets up and preaches anything, just about anything from That's scripture, right. because it, then people are mad at him because right. like people don't feel accepted by you. Right. 
And, well, and that's one of the key things, I mean, logistically in the local church, I think we've done ourselves a disservice by thinking we either have to reject people or accept them into membership. That's right. With the idea being that fellowship that you talked about and the Sabbath school, my friends, is uniquely suited to be that vehicle for fellowship and entrance into the mm -hmm. church family without becoming a member of the church itself, or at least not yet. It's that transitionary thing where people can learn the truth in a family atmosphere and you know go through the conviction that comes from learning the truth and make decisions for Christ that will lead to church membership and by God's grace eventually leadership. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we do ourselves a disservice when we have to choose between either no total rejection or full membership. And those That's are right. only two options. And the Lord didn't treat people that way. He no. received them and then he made them into something else. And that's what I was going to say. So our model here, you know, key point number one, everyone is a witness. Key point number two, attitude determines outcome. But the model for attitude is Jesus. That's right. The model for acceptance is Jesus. Yes. Yes, we accept people just like Jesus accepted people. And in those terms of... Jesus did not accept people's sins. That's right. He gave them power. As many as received him, mm -hmm. he gave power, power to become the sons of God, et cetera, et cetera. So, Amen. Um, you know, of course, our takeaway there is, is we want the attitude of Jesus in every capacity. And if we aren't witnessing like Jesus, we really aren't witnessing about Jesus. So it's if true. we're truly witnessing about Jesus, we want to have the attitude of Jesus. And that's the point of emphasis there, but we want to avoid those pitfalls right. that come in so often. Uh, when well, and, and to, to uh, a quick last point there is that people will say, from maybe from a first person perspective, because we're so always worried about what the other people might feel, but people might have a testament that says, when I came into this church, I felt condemned or I felt right. judged. I felt kind of looked down upon. And obviously, we don't want to be judgmental in our attitude and condemning in our, 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 our demeanor. But there's another thing that's at work, and it's not just us as human interaction. There's a supernatural interaction where the Holy Spirit is convicting people of truth so that even if everything you did was 100% right, they still might feel a little, you know, twinge in the conscience there, a little, a little, a little right. pricked in the soul because of the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting. It's not the condemnation of the church, but it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that might be at work in people's lives too. Well, there's the old saying, you know, when a person says, I, I feel guilty, it's probably because they are, you know, and <laughs> yeah. that goes for all of us. And I'm not trying to be flippant about it, yes. but just to say, we, we almost act like nobody's ever guilty. Mm. It's like you come into the church, if you have done what is contrary to your conscience, <laughs> yes. you're going to feel guilty about it. And it isn't because the church members are all staring you down, but you're going to feel that way. Exactly. You might think that they are, but that just isn't reality. And, and, may you know, it, it, it may be in some cases, but yeah. I have had many situations as a pastor where I've had people say, well, I feel condemned. And it's not because of the church. I've seen the church members. I've been some most loving churches and what have you, but people don't understand the nature of conviction of the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. so that, you know, and the reason that's important and why we're stating it is because I've seen church members then that if if some visitor or another church member gets upset and says, well, I feel guilty, and their guiltiness is coming from the fact that they've gone contrary to what they know the Bible is teaching, what the Spirit of Prophecy is teaching, what the pastor's preaching on, then they say, well, I feel so condemned in here. Then I've seen some church members take the side of that person and false sympathizing. Mm. Look up this in the writings of Ellen White, false sympathy, and you'll get uh, a number of yeah. things. But you're actually taking the devil's side of the argument mm. um, when you do things like that. So you gotta be, you've got to be careful when you're dealing with, you know, somebody says, I feel a certain way. Right. We want to have the attitude of Christ but even Jesus had people who, you know, the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus and was not altogether too happy about right. that Right, but you can't take away from that that Christ somehow did it wrong. Right. Everything he did was right, which moves us into our third point. Don't forget to tell the truth. That's right. It's so tempting to like, all right, we're going to have a good positive attitude. We're going to accept people as they are. And if we become friends, we won. Well, well the purpose of the friendship is to lead them to Christ and his truth. The idea the idea seems to be that you have to pick one or the other. You either tell them the truth or you accept them. Mm. You know, and I, again, I've had church members who say, Pastor, I don't want to tell my friend about the Sabbath because they seem so happy as a Sunday keeper. <laughs> and we've got, we've, we've, we've adopted the idea that truth is a, is a ball and chain mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of that which makes us free. You know, right. Jesus said the truth makes us free. And I think it's hard for for Seventh-day Adventists sometimes who've grown up knowing certain things about the truth to understand the value of it, 
for mm. people who don't. And we gave, I talked to you about, you know, when you're on that plane and you hit a lot of turbulence and that plane is going up and it, you sure feel good to get <laughs> on the ground with, with solid yeah. footing under yeah. you, you know. And that same experience is what happens when a person who didn't know the truth learns the truth. They have, mm. in, in a world of so much gray, there's finally some solid, something solid they mm. can stand on. Mm -hmm. And it's this point that Ellen White comments on when she says in Desire of Ages, the Comforter, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. And of course, we know Jesus himself said that he came to bear witness to the truth in John 18. Yes. Paul told Timothy that the church was built uh, as the pillar and ground of the truth. You know, mm. the whole idea of up truth. Why is this so important? Notice the Holy Spirit, his work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the Spirit of truth, and thus he becomes the Comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. Mm. And we just forget that. Sometimes we're like, well, I want them to feel safe and accepted and everything else. And look, there's a challenge in learning something's true that you always thought was false and learning that what you thought was true was false. Mm. And, and, and so that, there's a challenge in learning that, but that challenge is liberating. It doesn't shackle you. And because of our misunderstandings, we sometimes guard people from the truth. We're like, well, we want them to feel accepted, and so we're not going right. to tell them the truth. And we're not helping them. Well, exactly right. And sometimes it almost becomes, I hate to say it, a, a pious-sounding cover to evade the responsibility of telling truth. Yes. Right? Thursday's lesson on the first, very first sentence says, Jesus did not neglect presenting truth for, quote, love's sake. That's right. Because that would not have been love. Mm. Right, like the, the it would seem like oh, the loving thing to do is quote accept them and not tell the truth and hide the light. And he said, no, 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 no. The most ex the, the most genuine form of love is to tell the truth. And you know, there's this quote from Patriarchs, uh, I mean, Prophets and Kings, page one forty one. It is not from love for their neighbor that they, that is the ministers, smooth down the message entrusted to them, but because they are self indulgent and ease loving. True love seeks first the honor of God and the salvation of souls. Mm. Those who have this love will not evade the truth to save themselves from the unpleasant results of plain speaking. When souls are in peril, God's ministers will not consider self, but will speak the word given them to speak, refusing to excuse or palliate evil, that is, to make it seem less serious. That they won't, that a genuinely Christ like person doesn't seek to kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But just comfort without first clarifying right. the truth of God for you this person. You don't soften the message. And, and you look at the language here. Now, again, the context of that statement is the minister, but it, it goes for all of us. Notice, again, it says they don't... Uh, it's not from love for their neighbor. Right. It's not they, true love. Well, why is she saying that? Because she's addressing... The Lord is addressing to his prophet that that's what we think we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's what that minister thinks. He's like, i just doing it out of love. And the Lord puts his finger on the pulse of the thing and he says, it's not love yes. that's motivating you, it's selfishness. Whoa, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly the, true love seeks first the honor of God and salvation for souls. And so, you know, of course the lesson brings this out, presenting the truth in, in love, love, but it's, a, it, it's not presenting love instead of the truth. Mm -hmm. And again, a memory verse is, you know, to bear witness, uh, but to uh, uh, give a, a, a defense reason, yeah. with meekness and fear, mm -hmm. you've got that balance of the two. But the reason that we exist as Christians, as followers of Christ, is to carry on his, message, his mission and message of proclaiming the truth. Right. And so as much as it's important, the attitude I do it in, if I'm not proclaiming the truth, what's my attitude for? We talked about you can make, you can make friends on a lot of different levels. And we talk so much about making friends and how it's important that we make friends. Mm -hmm. But I had friends before I came to Christ, <laughs> but our friendship was based on going out and drinking together. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what happened after I stopped drinking. Well, the friendship fell apart. What's the basis for your friendships? Mm. Are you making friends who golf or are you making friends for God? And, and I'm not saying it's wrong to make friends with golf, but it, whatever. Right. But the point but your is, ultimate aim. this yeah. lesson is about making friends for God. Mm -hmm. And in order to make friends for God, you've got to share the truth of God. 
in love. Amen. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot of territory here, and no doubt there's going to be a lot of good conversation, but we would love to see those conversations not just be empty rhetoric, but actually edifying for the body of Christ that each one of us mm -hmm. can be the missionary like Jesus that he has called us to be. So let's close with a word of prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this great opportunity you have not only to uh, to have salvation in Jesus Christ for ourselves, but to be witnesses for that salvation to other people. Please, Lord, help us to become the missionaries that you want us to be. In fact, the very missionary that you exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, help us to present the truth always as it is in Jesus, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.